Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void were prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. 400 years ago, a trio of tiny kingdoms were perched on some damp islands off the coast of Europe. Within three short centuries, these islands would become the centre of an empire which ruled a quarter of the globe and on which the sun never set. I'm Samuel Hume, a historian of the British Empire, and my podcast Pax Britannica follows the people and events that built that empire into a global superpower. Learn the history of the British Empire by listening to Pax Britannica everywhere you find your podcasts, or go to pod.link slash pax. Hi everyone, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please support the Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the ancient world. Thanks again for listening. In the late 11th century BC, a kingdom was founded 20 kilometers south of Carchemish on the opposite bank of the Euphrates. The kingdom's capital was at Tel Amar, and both the capital and kingdom were known as Masuwari. In terms of territory, Masuwari was Carchemish's eastern reflection, controlling territories north and south along the Euphrates and east as far as the Balik River Valley. Another curious and confusing aspect is that the capital and kingdom each had two different names. The capital was called both Masuwari and Tilbarsip, and the kingdom was called Masuwari and Bit Adini. Luckily, we have a bit of background on how that came to pass. As historian Trevor Bryce relates, during the 10th century BC, Contemporary with the reign of the Suhi dynasty in Carchemish, Luwian hieroglyphic inscriptions provide the genealogies of two rival dynasties who competed with each other for the kingdom's throne. Kingship alternated between the two families, and the contest between them has been seen as ethnically based, with a Luwian-speaking dynasty being replaced by one of Aramean origin. The competing names for the capital and kingdom are seen as support for the assumption that there was a contest between Luwian and Aramean dynasties for royal power. Despite this variation, the material remains of the capital remain decisively Neo-Hittite, even when the city was under the rule of an Aramean regime. In fact, its architecture and sculpture show close parallels with the remains of nearby Carchemish. An inscribed stone stele from Tel Amar gives us what we know of the power struggle. As Bryce summarizes, the inscription conveys the violent seizure of power from the father of the inscription's author, a man named Ariahina. The man who sees power is not named, but is later identified as the father of a man named Hamiyata, with Hamiyata then succeeding his father. Once he was king, Hamiyata decided to elevate Ariahina's son to high status, even above that of his own brothers, possibly an attempt to restore the succession to the original royal line, or maybe to institute some sort of diarchal rule like in neighboring Carchemish. But on his death, Hamiyata's son turned against Ariahina's son, removing all benefits conferred on him by his father. In response, Ariahina's son rose up against him, defeated him, and claimed the throne. Now, none of these names will be on the test, But the main takeaway is that the political scene in Masuwari slash Bit Adini was a pretty volatile mix. 
And as you may recall from last episode, even while all this was going on, its rulers were apparently bold enough to risk provoking the Neo-Assyrians by overthrowing their vassals in neighboring kingdoms. To simplify things going forward, I'll use Bit Adini to refer to the kingdom and Til Barsip for the capital. As I noted, the material remains of Bit Adini reflect Karkemish ties. Reliefs of several gate lions at Til Barsip are similar to, and likely contemporary with, those depicted at Karkemish. A famous fragment of the head of a storm god facing right and wearing a horned helmet is identical to one at Karkemish, and may have belonged to an identical relief. A second group of fragmentary reliefs showing a victor's procession of soldiers and charioteers reflects the motif of one of Katua's monuments. All of which suggests that, at the very least, the neighboring kings were familiar with each other and perhaps had cordial relations. The most prominent monuments recovered from Tilbarsip are several large stone stelae depicting the Luwian storm god Tarhunta. The first is the source for the inscription above, recording the interdynastic power struggle. Another stele, known as Tel Amar VI, is the most recently recovered and best preserved, having fallen into the Euphrates in late antiquity. You can see some images at the wonderful resource HittiteMonuments.com under the page for Tel Amar. The stele's front face depicts Tarhunta standing atop a bull beneath a winged sun disc. The god wears a horned helmet and holds an axe in one hand and a thunderbolt in the other, with a sword hanging from his belt. The stele's reverse bears an inscription from King Hamiyata, recording his favor with the gods and resulting victories in battle. Following the reign of the last figure I mentioned above, the son of Ariahina, the throne of Bitadini was claimed by a figure named Ahuni. Like with Sangara at Carchemish, Ahuni's ties to the previous dynasties aren't well understood. It's been speculated that he may have belonged to the same Aramean tribe as Hamiyata, and returned to Tilbarsip to depose Ariahina's son and take control of the city. We're largely left to fend for ourselves since Ahuni left no inscriptions. But even without them, we know two things. First, that he ruled Bit Adini as an Aramean king, and second, that he was just as comfortable as his royal predecessors with challenging Neo-Assyria. In a sense, that die was already cast. Bit Adini was on the hook for staging the coup in nearby Lake, and was probably on Asher Nasserpal's radar from his very first year in power. But then Asher Nasserpal had a pretty lengthy to-do list. As events transpired, it took the king a few more years to return his focus to the region. When he did, it was to deal with yet more trouble in the exact same city of Suru. As discussed last episode, during his previous visit, Asher Nasserpal deposed the local king set up by Bit Adini and installed an Assyrian governor a man named Kuduru. Asher Nasserpal now relates that after passing through the land of the Bitshabi, he besieged the city Suru, the fortified city of Kuduru, governor of the land Suhu. Trusting in extensive Kassite troops, he attacked me to wage war and battle. I besieged the city and on the second day fought my way inside. In the face of my mighty weapons, Kuduru, with seventy of his soldiers, fell back to the Euphrates to save his life. I conquered the city. So, unpacking things a bit, it appears that the Assyrian governor, Kuduru, had enlisted the aid of the current Babylonian king, Nabu Apla Adina, in a bid to launch a rebellion which had lasted as long as it took Asher Nasserpal to march on and conquer the city. 
And by the way, if you want more details on Babylon's involvement, you can subscribe to the Patreon page, where I just dropped a mini-episode on early Iron Age Babylonia. After returning to his new capital of Kalhu, on which more in a bit, a larger rebellion broke out. So Asher Nasser Paul returned to Suhu and razed, destroyed, and burnt the cities which are on this bank of the Euphrates. He then crossed the Euphrates at the city Haridu by means of the boats which I had made, rafts made of inflated goatskins, which had moved along simultaneously with the army. Facing off against a rebel force of 6,000 men, Asher Nasser Paul defeated them then conquered, razed, destroyed, and burnt their cities. To be honest, this formulation is common enough that I'm just going to start shorthanding it as CRDB. And sure, it's a bit callous, but we're on a timetable here. It was in pursuit of another rebel, Ozzy Ely of Lake, that Asher Nasser Paul first entered the territory of Bit Adini. He defeated the rebel, then CRDB'd the local Bit Adini cities of Dumetu and Osmu. After once again returning to Kalhu, Asher Nasser Paul soon marched back to the land of Bit Adini and approached the city of Kaprabu, their fortified city, which hovered like a cloud in the sky. Giving some insight into Assyrian tactics, he notes that I besieged the city and conquered it by means of tunnels, battering rams, and siege towers. He also relates that, at that time, I received tribute from Ahuni, a man of Bit Adini, from whom the king took hostages, but otherwise supposedly showed mercy. This is the first Assyrian mention of King Ahuni by name. And since we've kind of established that mercy didn't exactly top the list of Assyrian virtues, there might be more to the story. I suspect that, like in other cases, where Assyrian kings claimed to bottle up rivals, which was Assyrianese for an unsuccessful siege, showing mercy is Assyrianese for unable to capture and kill. Not that I doubt the tribute part— Ahuni totally would have sent along the recorded cash of silver, gold, tin, bronze, cedar logs, and linen garments with multicolored trim, if only to keep the Assyrian king from attacking his capital of Tilbarsip. Another trip to Kalhu, and another return to Bit Adini, this time extorting a fortune in ivory products including dishes, couches, chests, and thrones decorated with silver and gold. Similar plunder by the king and his son, particularly in Phoenicia, comprised the large body of finely crafted objects known as the Nimrud Ivories. On this occasion, Bryce highlights that the payment also included chariots, cavalry, and infantry. Items clearly intended to boost the king's military resources for his expedition. Ahuni was also lucky that, this time, Asher Nasser Paul had a few other targets in mind. As the king relates, Moving on from the land of Bit Adini, I crossed the Euphrates, which was in flood, and approached the land Carchemish. He records that, I received tribute from Sengara, king of the land Hatti. The list of items he extorted from Carchemish is extremely long and detailed, and it may give some insight into why Singara is one of very few country lords who lack the means to erect a single monument. Like with Ahuni and Bitadini, Asher Nasser Paul claims that he took with me the chariots, cavalry, and infantry of the city of Carchemish. All the kings of the land came down and submitted to me. Bryce suggests that while some of these may have been minor kings, others may have ruled large states, including Kuma, Malachia, Gurgum, and possibly even Hamath. The main evidence being that Asher Nasser Paul didn't record marching into any of these kingdoms, 
So it's reasonably likely that, like Ahuni, their rulers had sent the Assyrian king tribute to keep him from directly invading. And at this point, I wanted to remind everyone about the new maps posted on the blog site. After leaving Carchemish, Asher Nasser Paul marched his swelling army off west, where he soon interacted with two more kingdoms that we've briefly mentioned before. Back in episode C9, we discussed King Taita, the self-proclaimed Palestinian king who ruled from the city of Aleppo. Like with Suhi the First last episode, I need to advance the dates of Taita's reign a few decades to the late 11th century BC. But otherwise, he's pretty well documented, with a statue and inscription at the Aleppo Temple and other inscriptions along the Orontes and across the Amuk Plain. Historian Mark Whedon suggests that the term Palestinian may have been the origin of Patanaya, the Neo-Assyrian ethnic adjective for the kings of the Amuk Plain. Whatever its derivation, at the current time, the kingdom was known as Patan. And by the time of Ashur Nasser Paul's campaign, the kingdom's capital had been moved from Aleppo to Tel Tayanat. Just like Bit Adini, the Patan capital had two contemporary names, Unki and Kinalua. And again, welcome to northern Syria. According to Whedon's reconstruction, during the 10th century BC, contemporary with the reign of the Suhi dynasty in Carchemish, Taita had been succeeded by his son, Taita II, then by a ruler called Manana, before a king came to power with the super Neo Hittite name of Supaluliuma, which possibly signaled a change in dynasty. Supaluliuma was succeeded by Halparuntaya, then by a king named Lubarna. And Asher Nasserpal records that, moving on from the river, I approached the city Kinalua, the royal city of Lubarna, the Patinu. He took fright in the face of my raging weapons and fierce battle and submitted to me to save his life. And, again, cue the long list of tribute and the loan of the chariots, cavalry, and infantry of the Patinu. I mentioned last episode that Asher Dan II had defeated an Aramean tribe called the Yahani, whose remnants had fled across the Euphrates to found the kingdom of Bit Agusi. Asher Nasserpal next records that I received tribute from Gusi, a man of the land Yahani. Crossing the Orontes, the Assyrian king then marched south to Patan's border with the neighboring kingdom of Luash. Investing the local Patan city of Arabua, Asher Nasserpal sent his army into Luash for a bit of the old CRBD, noting that I captured soldiers alive and impaled them on stakes before their cities. The entry implies that Unlike every other kingdom so far, Luash actually took a stab at resisting the Assyrian advance. The price of their defiance was instructive. As Bryce relates, news of Luash's fate traveled before the king as he marched southwards along the Levantine coast, and any thought of resistance instantly vanished. All the wealthy Phoenician cities, Arwad, Byblos, Sidon, and Tyre opened their gates and heaped up piles of tribute. In an echo of the ancient Akkadian kings, Asher Nasserpal records that he cleansed my weapons in the great sea and made sacrifices to the gods. The last major march of the year's campaign was north to the Amanus Mountains, where the king cut down logs of cedar, cypress, and juniper. He also records that he erected an inscribed stele recording his achievements. Historian George Rue notes that before returning to Kalhu, Asher Nasserpal also founded and garrisoned two fortresses, Nibarti Ashur and Kar Asher Nasserpal, along the Middle Euphrates. So, lots of takeaways from the whole affair. First, if the list of tribute is remotely accurate, 
and the Assyrians were pretty good with that stuff. The Neo-Hittite and Aramean kingdoms had grown enormously wealthy over the past century and a half, though their military forces, at least individually, were still no match for the Assyrians. Second, it's clear that Asher Nasserpal had studied the campaign of Tiglath-Pileser I, since he'd traveled along the exact same route and employed a similar approach intimidation and extortion as opposed to outright conquest. Third, there's the litany of abject brutality to anyone offering resistance. While those who submitted were subject to extortion, taxation, plunder, and forced conscription into work gangs. That was the sum of the available options. There was no carrot, only the stick. Consequently, most Assyrian subjects vacillated between grudging acceptance and open revolt. It's a dynamic that defined the Neo-Assyrian era and made them into one of the most despised empires of the ancient world. The biggest takeaway of the whole affair was all the stuff Asher Nasser Paul literally took away. Immeasurable wealth, countless prestige goods, and enormous stockpiles of natural resources. Or, more to the point, construction materials. While he'd never inscribe it, Asher Nasser Paul also took away something else. An admiration of the palaces, monuments, and royal reliefs on display in the Syrian kingdoms, particularly those raised by the country lord Katua of Carchemish. Though he'd begun construction of his new royal capital prior to his recent western campaigns, its final contours were clearly influenced by the cultures of northern Syria. Assur would always be Assyrian ground zero, their royal necropolis and home of their god. And Asher Nasserpal embellished the city with refurbished temples to Assur, Sin, and Shamash, and a magnificent new royal gate. Kalhu, by contrast, was designed as a showpiece, a monument to the power and glory of a single Assyrian king. According to historian Mark van de Meerup, Asher Nasser Paul laid out a city wall eight kilometers long and enclosing an area of 360 hectares. And on top of the large citadel in the southwest corner, constructed his palace, several temples, and a ziggurat. The palace alone was over 200 meters long and at least 120 meters wide, built around a vast courtyard. Completion of the work took 15 years, and once the last relief was carved and inscription inscribed, it was time for a major party. On his famous banquet stele, Asher Nasserpal records that he summoned a group of 70,000 people to attend the consecration of his palace at Kalhu. For ten days I gave them food, I gave them drink, I had them bathed, I had them anointed. Thus did I honor them and send them back to their lands in peace and joy. The stele also details the menu, which included 14,000 fattened sheep, 10,000 fish, and 10,000 containers of wine. Among those present were 5,000 dignitaries and envoys of the people from recently dominated Syrian lands, including Carchemish, Malachia, Kuma, Gurgum, Patton, Tyre, and Sidon. If Sangara of Carchemish personally attended, he would have very likely been blown away by the scope and scale of the project. He also would have found at least a few elements more than a little familiar. Two sides of Kalhu's central square were embellished with colossal reliefs, while a freestanding obelisk held scenes of subjects with various types of tribute, a precursor of the more famous obelisk later raised by his son. Historian Julian Reed suggests that just as the great gate of the city of Assur featured a virtual museum of scepters captured from foreign kings, Kalhu's central plaza was also likely systematically decorated with commemorative monuments and trophies. 
the most impressive and imposing pieces were reserved for the royal palace. Approaching the central door of the throne room, Sangara would have been confronted by two massive human-headed winged bulls called Shedu, more commonly known as Lamasu, still among the most defining images of Neo-Assyrian art. The walls of the throne room were lined with reliefs of a wide variety of protective spirits. Other reliefs showed foreigners bringing tribute to Asher Nasserpal and other officials. Sangara would have noted that some were depicted dressed in the Syrian style. The wall behind the Assyrian throne held another striking image. Two mirrored reliefs of Asher Nasserpal flanking a sacred tree with a figure in a winged disc floating above, likely the god Asur, and protective spirits close behind. Inscriptions running along the walls recorded Asher Nasrpal's qualities as a king, the number of foreign lands he'd conquered, and the animals he'd hunted. The accompanying reliefs showed the king killing lions and attacking enemy cities, including at least one city in Syria. It was in this fairly imposing setting that Sangara of Carchemish would come face to face with King Asher Nasserpal II. On the bright side, this was a happy occasion, a ten-day party to mark the completion of the king's new royal city. And, spoiler alert, Kalhu, also known as Nimrud, will continue to be the Assyrian capital for most of the remainder of this series. One notable exception to the attendee list was the land of Bit Adini and its Aramean king, Ahuni. I mean, maybe he wasn't feeling well or had to work late or take his kids to soccer practice, but considering his prominence in Assyrian annals, it's a fairly curious absence. As historians Michael Brown and Stefan Smith point out, Ahuni may have been engaged in some opportunistic upsizing. When Asher Nasserpal passed through Bit Adini territory on the way to Carchemish, his description didn't include any Bit Adini holdings west of the Euphrates. But when the next Assyrian king came west, he'd record at least six fortified cities west of the Euphrates controlled by Bit Adini. In fact, over the next decade or so, Ahuni appears to have taken advantage of Sangara's weakness to take control of dozens of cities, holdings that appear to have surrounded Carchemish in all directions. As I just implied, the next Assyrian king to come west was not Asher Nasserpal II. I mean, why would he, when so much of the wealth of the Syrian kingdoms continually flowed east into Kalhu? In addition to its remarkable carved stone palace, the tribute funded a variety of works. Botanical gardens and animal preserves, irrigation canals, and royal orchards so lush that, as Asher Nasserpal noted, fragrance pervades the walkways. New temples rose to Enlil and Ninurta, while those to other gods— Adad, Gula, and Nabu among them, were refounded and decorated in a splendid fashion. Assyrian craftsmen also honed their skills on other artistic forms. Royal stelae, painted plaster and glazed brickwork, and at least one statue of the king himself, recovered from the Temple of Ishtar. Abandoned cities were renovated and resettled, ancient palaces rebuilt, and grain storehouses restocked. With his enemies subdued, Asher Nasserpal devoted his time to hunting dangerous and exotic animals, including wild elephants, bulls, oxen, and, particularly, lions. But all good things must come to an end, and in 859 B.C., after ruling Assyria for 24 years, Asher Nasserpal II finally passed away. Of all his fairly remarkable achievements, one took pride of place. By the end of his reign, and largely through his efforts, the Assyrian Empire recovered all territories lost since the Bronze Age collapse, and even expanded a bit beyond. 
Since Asher Nasser Paul had been absent from Syria for roughly a decade now, some may have viewed his Western campaigns as Assyrian aberrations. But it's doubtful Ahuni allowed himself that luxury. With all the territory seized from Carchemish, Bitadini was now the wealthiest and most powerful kingdom in all of northern Syria. Not to mention that most of its holdings were located east of the Euphrates. All of which made it a tempting target for the new Assyrian king, Shalmaneser III. The Ancient World Podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network, along with My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, The Explorers Podcast, and other great shows.